I welcome everyone to tonight's meeting of Montpelier City Council. Do we have any changes to the agenda? Uh, well, the no uh, Green Mountain Transit item. Yeah. The, what's it here? We'll here till the 24th. Okay, any others? Okay, if not, we'll consider the without objection, the agenda will be approved without that or with that uh, change. Next item is general business and appearance. Anybody here to comment on anything that's not our agenda? Does it look like it? Move to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve that? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Are not all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? And zoning. So this is our final hearing on the zoning and river hazard regulations. This is a public hearing, so anyone just comment on that? This would be the opportunity to do that. Mike? Right. Well, for your last, hopefully, well, final time, appearance yes. before the council <laughs> on zoning for the rest of your life. I bet you hope. <laughs> one, would, one would hope. I won't invite oh. it back. I thought we were promised no, we another should. in six months. We live months longer than that. <laughs> That's well. true. It only feels like an eternity, doesn't <laughs> it? Yes. Um, so I guess the only thing I will preface this um, discussion on was the email that I sent you this afternoon if there were any questions on that um, so really we uh, approved on the 20th you approved on the 20th the final changes we incorporated those changes put those changes online um, and we recognize I recognize at the time we had put it online that there were some weird things that had happened to the formatting some indenting that had happened and in one section of the 3204, for whatever reason, it lost its its numeration, so it didn't have numbering. So I was like, all right, well, we'll get it online because we need to put it online, and we'll send it off to Brandy, the consultant, to figure out what's up with the formatting. She reformatted and got it back to me today, where we noticed the <coughs> weird thing that we've been chasing for a while, which is that every time we change a thing, it'll say C section 3004.D, and we're like, well, that's the wrong section. We'll fix it. Well, every time we save it, the Word document goes back and goes and says, oh, that's the wrong one. We'll put it back to 3004D. So what was online had a, I don't know, a half dozen or a dozen of these little references. So I went through the entire document, double checking back to make sure that you know we had what was in the approved draft, the correct citations. And so I cleaned those up. And what I basically had to do is to break, break the link. So in the original document, if you saw one of those C3004, you literally could take your mouse and click on it and it would send you there. Well, now it's not going to send you there. Because what it would do if we left it there was send you to the wrong place. So uh, that was the only way I could get to fix it. I'm sure there's a, a prettier, more elegant way of doing it. But um, So what you do have, what I did email you, was the correct version. So if you were to look in your footnote, on the footnote, it would say final draft. Um, January 3rd, 2018. And so I made three final copies in case there was somebody who wanted a hard copy just as. So we had a lot of changes in our last meeting, and yep. I'm sure, well, maybe others have been diligent and read it and cross checked against all the requests, but I expect a lot of having, and we're going to find, you know, there'll be people mm -hmm. who scrub it and say, well, that's not really what I. What if that happens? What is, what are the. What's the avenue? How would we? we is, how do we change? Like, if somebody says you did this and it's not reflected accurately here, I mean, what's the process for okay. fixing I'd, that? I hope that the way I'd done it, we would have very few of those. But yeah, and we may not have any. Reason, I just yeah. yeah. So, what was put online? First of all, for anyone who did want to go and diligently double check to make sure we had done it all right, there is also a strikeout copy from what was done on the twentieth. You know, based on or what was done pre-hearing to post-hearing, there was a strikeout copy that was made as well. So if you really want to see what changes were made and approved on the 20th, those are all in there in a strikeout. If you want to go and fix it, the, probably the fastest way to fix a mistake like that, we would, we would have to go through and do an interim zoning amendment, which is a relatively short process if we found one that was wrong. Um, we could always check with our legal counsel to go through and see if if there was a mistake that was approved and we adopt this and find out that there was a, a change that was supposed to have been made that wasn't, 
I don't know if we can just go and do it, but I'm, I've never, I've never had had a case come up like that, so I really would just have to check with legal counsel. Well, so uh, the worst case scenario is you do uh, uh, an interim zoning amendment to make that correction. Okay. Okay. Rosie, did you? I just wanted to make sure that the changes you made with breaking the links don't affect the fact that we properly warned. No, it it wouldn't. In fact, this actually by breaking the links, you had to to actually get it correct because in in the matrix you said. You know, approve, fix, change 300D to 3005. And so I make that change, I save it, I put it online, and it automatically changes it back to what it was incorrect. So correcting it doesn't actually change what was approved. Okay. And the links are, you know, a convenience tool, they're not really the substance, you know, because you still, the end link is the actual mm -hmm. regulation. We need to make a motion. Um, so, yeah, no. If there are no other comments, we'll close the hearing and set the motion. Um, I've turned set in the format. Um, I make a motion to accept the master plan as presented. No, zoning, zoning. as presented. Uh, zoning. We've got a unified unified development regulations is one to be adopted, and the okay. river hazard regulations is the other. Unif John Odin, do you have a <coughs> And River Hazard? River Hazard Regulation. So your motion is to uh, accept the Unified Development Regulations and River Hazard Regulations? Yes. Yes. Is there a second? A second. Is there any discussion? There are none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Congratulations. Thank you. And thank you again, Mike, for all your incredible work. More than I needed. <laughs> <laughs> Expecting more questions. Ready to be here at all? I'll take a final copy. <laughs> Happy problem. That's the way we're going to scare questions away. Been uh, worn down. All right. Great work, everyone. It's a big accomplishment. Okay. Uh, I don't see Jeff Byer here. Is he the person we're going to mm -hmm. be looking at for the Hubbard Park land? I think I'm missing. Yeah, I don't see him either. Okay. So. I see Jack here. Jack, are you going to be? Are you waiting on anybody else for the uh, housing? You're ready to go. Great. Okay, so we'll move to item eight, the uh, housing trust fund. And Kevin Casey with the uh, planning development. Welcome. Sure. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I'm Jack McCullough, the uh, chair of the Montpelier Housing Task Force, and I'm here to talk about the uh, proposal for the. Uh, Housing Trust Fund for fiscal 2019. And uh, as I talk about it, what I I think the we really have a two-part message uh, to tell you tonight. One is that uh, the Housing Task Force is taking, and we believe the city should be taking, uh, a progressive, forward-looking approach to how we structure these uh, programs and address not simply the issues that we have today, but the issues that we can anticipate having in years to come so that we can continue to make progress toward uh, toward the goals that uh, the city has recognized for some time. Uh, developing new housing, making new housing uh, possible uh, within the city and making it affordable for people who uh, want to live here and become contributing members <coughs> of our community. And so that's one of our messages today, and we think that our proposal <coughs> will move us along in that direction. And and the second message is uh, that we want to be uh, uh, responsive to the concerns that we've had heard from the uh, council in previous sessions. and. Uh, and you'll see that the proposal we brought for you today addresses the concerns that we've had. And I hope, uh, I, I hope, I hope uh, that message comes across well. Um, what we've talked about, and, and the full <coughs> dollar amount is not uh, set forth in our proposal, but, uh, but our goal 
our message is, is to really do four things. One is to maintain the base funding of $60,000 that, that we had this year to enable us to carry on with the uh, home the new homeowner down payment assistance program. And uh, we documented how successful it's been, how we've been able, how yeah, the program has enabled people to move into the city, and that's what we want. Move, move, move here, um, recognizing that, that it's somewhat more expensive to live here in Montpelier than in our neighboring towns, but it, it's a benefit to the city to have new families move into the city. And uh, we, we know how to do the program. It works well. Um, the uh, grant originally was $15,000 for a down payment assistance, assistance payment. It's now $10,000. The way that the payment works, that <coughs> money is provided to the, uh, <coughs> in, as a check at closing. So as the payment, all the documents and all the uh, funds that are changing hands at the closing include that uh, the uh, mortgage and the $10,000 payment. The promissory note, it's all there as part of the package. So as the closing goes forward, that, this is part of what happens to enable the family to close <coughs> on the purchase. And, uh, <coughs> and it, we think it's vital to, uh, to some, of these, uh, some of these purchases. Um, we recognize that we're not going to grow the city's population uh, six families at a time in the down payment assistance program, so we're looking at other, uh, other sources of revenue and other uses of revenue, too. Our experience has been that uh, every few years the uh, <coughs> downstreet comes in with a proposal to uh, really change the housing market by creating new housing in the city, new affordable housing in the city. And we have uh, the French block across the street, which is uh, well on the way. And we can anticipate that happening again. If we're stuck at $60,000 a year, we're not going to uh, be able to get there. But what we've seen in the uh, programs funded by the uh, trust fund is that we've actually added money to the uh, to the grand list. We've generated tax revenue by the, the investments the city council has made in the trust fund. And our, we propose to reinvest 25% of the incremental value each year in, uh, in the trust fund going forward. Um, this year, uh, fiscal 2019, this would amount to almost $30,000, or twenty nine six sixty four seventy five in uh, in additional funds to the trust fund if the council uh, dedicates 25% of the incremental taxes for one year to the uh, trust fund. Is that just to clarify a question on that, is that be 25% of the new value for any investment or any um, money or project that has received funding, any funding from the trust fund? Mm -hmm. Yes. So if the trust fund, we put in $8,000 and somebody puts in a million dollars that results in $200,000 to pick a number. In revenue, you take 25% of that even though the initial contribution was 8000 a small incremental contribution. In answer to the question of how that would work, I would say yes, that's how it would work. What I would say, I go, go beyond that to say that uh, in a number of projects, having that uh, local contribution from the city's trust fund, one of the things that uh, was able to bring in other funds. So, yeah, it's not, it's not just, well, $8,000 is nothing on a million dollar project. The money that comes from the city could be the difference between a project happening and not. Um, the third source of fund which we propose is to dedicate 25% of the room, rooms and meals, the local option rooms and meals tax to the, uh, to the trust fund. And 
I don't know if there's statistics that we've seen yet, but uh, anecdotally what we're hearing is that the uh, entities like Airbnb have uh, have really had an effect on the uh, on the housing market. The people who, who could be renting uh, property out to uh, to permanent renters, now they can uh, <coughs> rent it out uh, three or four weekends a month and generate the revenue and uh, take that off the housing market, and make the housing unavailable for uh, people who want to move in here as renters. And so, uh, in recognition of the fact that uh, the uh, rental market, the temporary rental market, uh, is having an effect on the uh, housing market. We propose also 25% of the uh, local homes <coughs> and yield tax to go to the trust fund. And again, for fiscal 2019, <coughs> the projection is 218,000, so the total 25% of that would be 54,500. So the total request would be $144,164.75. If we're sticking to all the uh, individual dollars and pennies. Can I just ask Bill a question there? Um, <coughs> we don't currently levy the rooms and meals tax on Airbnbs, or we don't have a way of doing that, or we do, but people don't necessarily we do it. <laughs> we levy the tax on anything the state levies the tax on. Okay. So we don't... We don't administer it ourselves, so whatever the state collects on. So I think the state is working on collecting the tax, you know, lose taxes on. Yeah, yeah. The way it works is <coughs> the, the director, the person who <coughs> goes to the Airbnb doesn't pay the homeowner directly. They pay the company. That right? company sends, sends the tax money to you. Okay, so we are successfully collecting taxes on those. Yeah. Okay. Okay. As of, I think, <coughs> January <coughs> of 17. Okay, I remember hearing some stuff about yeah. not and being I think able to it was tax went into effect in January 17. I'm not positive. Anyway. It's just not an individually. Yeah, it's not individual city controlled. Mm -hmm. that what was that total you gave, Jeff? 144, 164, 75. And then the last piece of the picture, <coughs> which is not something that we're saying this is money to put into the 2019 budget, but that is recapture of funds for, uh, for beneficiaries for the first time home buyer program. We've heard what you said, that the people are needy when they come into the program. They, <coughs> their prospects improve. They may not be hurt by paying it back. And so the proposal is, as a program design, that uh, if the family's income has, uh, has grown, they're, uh, they're no longer at that 125% level. That when they sell the house, the money would come back into the fund. Obviously, we're not, we don't have a dollar now because that's not happening yet. But <coughs> we can anticipate over time that that would go to uh, increase the, the fund. And so that's that's our request. And we'd ask that we hope you can support it and build it into the budget the way we uh, structure it. Thank you, Jack. Question or questions? Here? Uh, so, um. <coughs> Kevin and I had a really productive conversation um, a couple weeks ago, the, you know, prior to the previous meeting when we thought we were going to talk about this, about a bunch of other ways that we could get at this problem um, and, and kind of um, make housing more accessible. Um, and there were we had a lot of creative ideas. And so um, I would like to propose that rather than um, – dedicating, you know, saying here's our $60,000 this year, we want it to go to this one project, specifically the First Time Home Buyers Program. I would like to instruct the um, task force and um, the trust fund to um, consider some of those alternatives that we discussed, um, and some of those included taking some of the revolving loan funds we have um, and combining them and um, figuring out ways to make the, that money more um, accessible to um, hit some of these problems that, that we've talked about um, having. Um, and so I want to continue to work on this, and I don't want to limit ourselves by saying, here's $60,000, it's going to first-time home buyers. <coughs> because I think that if we do some more work here, we can come up with an even better way of spending that money. Um, I, 
you know, I've, I've talked before about how I'm concerned that first-time home buyers, while it's not terrible, it isn't the best use of that money. And so um, I kind of like the opportunity to explore that more uh, by not locking us into um, spending the money that way. And then if, if the trust fund decides that after those discussions that is the best way, um, then I, you know, that they could present that to the council in the future. Um, but I, I want to create some space for that conversation to happen. So you would be just wanted to have time to work and meet with the... Uh, and and I customers. will commit to um, working more closely with the task force on, on some of those ideas. Well, we'd love to see you. Yeah. Third Thursday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've already been told. <laughs> I, as I understand the... Uh, the budget appropriation, I think it's $60,000 to the trust fund. I don't right. think it specifically says this is how it shall be paid. Right. And so I, I don't think any change would need to be done tonight to uh, operate. And I would just want to make it clear that we weren't sending a message from the council to the trust fund that this is exactly how we wanted it spent because we want to allow them to have that flexibility to, to think through those things. Uh, um, well, I guess to that end, I mean, I wonder if we <coughs> should be at least saying, uh, you know, we anticipate uh, spending sixty thousand uh, dollars on this fund, and we'll discuss how um, how it ought to be uh, allocated, and and that's a, a discussion I, I think we probably can have. I just don't want to miss the opportunity to, you know, maintain our level of support of the fund. So. No, and I'm in support of continuing to, to okay. set $60,000 aside for housing. Okay. I just don't want to lock us into this one particular avenue. Sure. I totally agree with you, although I would say that the message we'd like to hear is we're going to devote $144,000 <laughs> right, right, right. to the fund <laughs> and we'll have uh, <laughs> a discussion at the right. task force and the trust fund board of how to spend it. And just as by way of background, we had this discussion, and it was actually before Rosie was on and um, and Ashley were on last year, and the, the housing task force request comes out of, out of um, uh, they, they looked at the, the $140,000 number was actually a function of looking at first-time home buyers as well as um, projects. So if you were to fully fund projects and programs currently, that's what the and to build the reserve, the one hundred and forty thousand would do that. Build the reserve, fund the first time home buyers, and fund projects on a four to five year basis. So this this number, although it seems very large, it's actually it's it's there was a, a bunch of work put into it last year and I'm happy to share that with everybody to the, the task force put a lot of work into that in November of 16? Yeah, so yeah, so it was before the. Times, I think, yep. but, yeah. but um, I'll, I'll circulate that for everybody too, so that they have it going forward. I'm also comfortable uh, supporting the city manager's recommendation that we hold funding at $60,000 for this year. I do uh, applaud your creativity in many of these new recommendations. I'd like to ask a couple questions, if I may, um, to help better understand this and also. Um, to confirm a couple things. Thank you very much for uh, including the possibility of a payback. I think that was Councillor Kruger who thought about maybe the unintended consequence there, or Mayor Holler's suggestion that, well, you know, I may have qualified this when I bought my house and, and now that I've established myself, why wouldn't I be expected to put this money back into the trust fund? Uh, I guess I'd, the only adjustment I would suggest is that you consider changing the 125 percent of medium income to 100 percent. I mean, that's sort of right in the middle. and. Uh, or presumably below that number, you're, you do need assistance and help, and if you're above that, you may not. So that was just one thought there. Just an aside, Justin, on that one, the, it's actually supposed to be 120, 120 um, percent, um, but that 120 percent is the state's um, threshold for affordable, affordability. That's where that just... So if, you're, if you're making 120, well, 20 percent higher than the median income, is that would be correct then that then you wouldn't necessarily need a subsidy right right okay so I guess I'm just questioning that assumption on, as a policy matter um, but I can appreciate wanting it to be the same as the state level um, didn't know if there's a quick update in terms of when the French block may be ready to have people move in I know it's a complicated project but is there any sort of tentative date at which this housing will be completed and available to people I haven't heard anything in the last month or two. Um, 
Yeah, the last I knew, they were opening bids in mid-December yeah. and preparing to award contracts and the grants right around work. now and you know, start work in the next month or so um, once they get all that ironed out. But you know, I don't know how long the project takes once they start work. Yeah. And on the grant side, it's just it's, there's you know finishing up fine details on the response. So it, it's close. It's you know they're moving forward. Anticipate construction <coughs> beginning then this year. Yeah, shortly. Yeah, I would say within yeah. the next yeah. month or two, Absolutely. and then maybe a year or two to complete all that. Or I mean, any sort of a time frame here in terms I think of when it's supposed it'll to be, be available. In 2018, right? I moved in. I think it's my my understanding, and and again, we'd have to confirm this with Downstreet, um, but that they were supposed to start construction or demolition uh, this winter and be <coughs> fully engaged by the spring. Great. So. Great news. Um, in regards to your suggestion around rooms and meals, I just comment that um, we were this council or the previous council was very specific when putting this before voters that this new tax that we were proposing was going to be used for infrastructure and economic development. And I didn't know if you were uh, intending us to add on a quarter percent or to then shift the way that those monies were being spent. Well, um, no, we're not talking about adding. Uh anything to the tax, but uh, I think it's it's very clear uh, not only from uh, market expect experts around the <coughs> state, but also even from our own ec economic development uh, report that, that housing development is economic development. Mm -hmm. Housing development is one of the things that uh, enables us to have uh, thriving economies, and uh, we've already targeted that as uh, an important goal or important economic development goal. Thank you. So I think that keeps faith, keeps the keeps the bargain with the with the taxpayers and the voters to do that. Yeah. Uh, do, does anybody know if the like Airbnb taxes are separated? Like can you tell exactly how much <coughs> revenue was generated by Airbnb rentals? That would be the state tax department right. would have to do that. I, so we just get it as a bulk. This is how much was collected in your city for rooms right. meals. And right. But if we can see the state data and if the state data has it broken down, I would be totally comfortable with Airbnb, you know, with the percentage of Airbnb stuff going to affordable housing if that, if that breakdown exists. It's probably just lumped under rooms collection. But we'd have to look. I don't I know mean, if they would do it for a single pair <coughs> because I think that that would be... I don't know. I'll, I'll, I can find out. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm curious if they do. I'm Airbnb might even have it. <laughs> yeah. But, I don't know. Um, and then I guess my second piece is I was just looking at some information from the latest census, and um, I, I feel pretty strongly that even 125% of median income in Vermont is still a, a pretty low dollar amount when you look. I mean, Compared to states around us, our median income is the lowest compared to Massachusetts and New Hampshire and New York. Um, and, you know, just just myself in my own experience looking at the rental market and, you know, sort of what is and isn't affordable and, and how few choices there are, you know, and if home buyership is even an option for you at 125%, I mean, that's pretty amazing. So I, I feel pretty strongly that 125% that should just be the baseline. and. Maybe we should even explore going a little higher than that because that's really not that much money. And if the goal is to bring in, you know, young families with children, and you're only talking about 125 percent, you're still pricing out a whole bunch of people from the Montpelier housing market. You definitely are, and uh, you know, you can say, well, 100 percent of median is right in the middle. That's true, but when you look at uh, incomes in comparison to housing costs in a uh, city like Montpelier. You are, you're absolutely right. Preach into the choir. You're really <laughs> squeezed. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. Uh, so perhaps I'm just being a little methodical about this, but so there were four uh, proposals. I mean, I am, I've already mentioned I'm, I'm very much in favor of the first one of at least maintaining $60,000. Um, as far as the, the, you know, reinvestment of, um, money from projects that we are donating to, I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, 
if we can take that increased grand list uh, revenue, put it back into affordable housing, which is a deep need in this city, uh, then that is a worthwhile uh, endeavor. Uh, and then, you know, it's it's the kind of thing that I think once we have too much affordable housing, then maybe we can think about <laughs> readjusting that number. Um, but we are so far from it right now that uh, I'm, I'm in favor of that. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I had the same thought too, Justin, about the meals, rooms, and alcohol tax. You know, when we proposed this, it uh, had certain, uh, you know, ideas. But I, I appreciate your, your thoughts there, Jack, about, you know, that this, uh, Affordable housing is is economic development. It's bringing more people into town. It's, uh, I mean, part of the EDSP was uh, about housing, um, and that's that. This is this is doing that. Um, one of the things that I, uh, I guess, I, so, forgive me for my, my confusion here. Um, how much money were you proposing coming out of the twenty five percent for meals, rooms, and alcohol? Fifty four five. Fifty four. So. Um, and that's in addition, I mean, we're already allocating, what, like $100,000 from that to uh, the, development development. To the Development Corporation. So how much does that, do we know how much that leaves? Well, it's a, the, the budget revenue is 218000 um, okay. so the remainder, 118000 is revenue offsetting with, you know, the capital. Mm -hmm. um, so there's plenty of uh, room uh, for that. No, it's going to see it. <laughs> oh, sorry, CFP. Thank you. Well, anyway, I'm willing to talk about that one. Um, and then the um, recapture funds. Um, I think that I think that plan also makes some sense. You know, keeping this uh, you know, money for people who, who uh, really need it. So, um, yeah, I'm willing to talk about three, but I'm in favor of one, two, and four. Done. I really appreciate every time you come, you come with solid data and new ideas. And I would love to see the council explore more of these, if not in this budget, certainly in future budgets. They're all good ideas. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on something that Councillor Watson said, which is we're so far from achieving an appropriate level of affordable housing. You may remember several years ago I asked what sort of our comparable communities or neighboring communities, what is their sort of target level of the percentage of total housing stock that, and I know there's a couple different definitions there in terms of making it fully subsidized or partially subsidized or just providing incentives. Do you have any numbers for us in terms of um, how, what percentage we do have that is uh, benefiting from some sort of subsidy in total housing stock and what, second question would be, what a sort of an appropriate target might be and are we, so then we can figure out, are we at, do we need to keep adding more faster? Are we already in excess of that? It would help us to kind of guide that. Well, I think, I mean, and, and I provided these numbers before and Jack, or uh, the Housing Task Force as well, it's, um, it, it's, it, there's a certain nuance to it because it's, it's not as simple as it looks. Um, and, and, and it really gets at, at, at the, the core of, um, you know, like Downstreet does, um, you know, some of their, their units are market rate. So, you know, that's, you can't just say like, oh, all of their project, all of their units are affordable housing. They're an affordable housing project, but they are, some of those are set aside as market. But you rate. know which ones are market and which ones aren't. I mean, can't you just count the ones that are. But then there's the, the other, the, but you can't, you have to be careful because then you can double count because some of those, for example, if you have downstreet, but then you have a section eight voucher, you can have a section eight voucher, which is, which is paying for your, you know, a portion of your unit if you're very low income. Um, but you have to be careful to not double count that because if I just look at the number of Section 8 vouchers, that will give me one number. But then I have to kind of cross-reference it with the other existing units, which takes... Um, but as far as appropriate number, I... I no. So, that's I, it. so I, there is no way to count the number of subsidies. There is, and we did that a few years city. ago. That it's, like that would be a it is, but it's not number. as... Um, it, it, it takes a fair <laughs> amount of groundwork from Downstreet, uh, uh, um, Mount Housing, Housing Authority, Authority. Yeah. all the kind of players that, that have either, you know, a, a subsidy, a voucher, a unit, um, and then they have to kind of... And what is the city's target number or percentage? There is not a target number. We don't have um, one. 
you're here or anywhere else. It's not the way right. uh, government entities think about uh, housing programs. The other thing that I could say, and I don't have these statistics with me, uh, although I have them back at my office, is that the, the number of low, what you might consider low income, subsidized housing units in the city is smaller than the number of uh, housing units, subsidized housing units that people like me occupy in the city. That the, uh, the mortgage interest deduction and the uh, property tax uh, tax break are uh, exceed the uh, number of subsidized housing. Hey. I, un I understand. I read the full report from before, and I did my best to understand it, certainly, that there is a lot of nuance here, and I can appreciate even within one unit, you have a huge spectrum in terms of the percentage of the total rent that the people that are living in those units are paying. So I get that there's a ton of gray area here. I guess I'm just expressing that it's difficult to make uh, funding decisions without, A, having a sort of a general target that we're trying to achieve, or, B, having any metrics, even the most liberal, for how we might measure where we are today. Well, if you're... Well, I think that there is a way to do it. I mean, if you look at we want to have a healthy housing market. So most experts agree that a healthy housing market has about 5% vacancy. We are currently operating at about functional zero. So that, you know, and if you talk to, uh, and that's what the census will tell you, that's what, you know, Vermont housing data will tell you that we're, you know, below 1%. And if you talk to the, your landlords, um, they will tell you that their only vacancies are when they're doing work on an apartment or if there's a fire, um, or if <laughs> yeah, that's that's when you have vacancies. Um, uh, otherwise, you're you're just you know hot bunking people. They're they're moving out, and you're moving somebody right in, and which actually affects quality as well. So, you know, um, you know your healthy housing market has five percent vacancy. So what we can do from a government entity is work on affordable housing because that's where we can that's where you know our funding sources come from. That's that's you know we're we're, we're we're helping where the market fails. So if, it, you know, the, the true market rate would be, is, is significantly <coughs> higher than what I think most people um, find palatable. Uh, you know, you see this with what the proposed rents for new projects are, and they are astonishingly high. And I guess that's kind of where maybe I'm getting a little confused, is if there's such high demand for housing mm -hmm. and that potentially um, – that rents are perhaps higher than they should be because of that limited supply. Why are we seeing so little growth in our grand list? Growth or, in our or grand new, list or, or growth in our excuse units? me, new new units coming online. Well, I, I mean that is a, that's a that's the kind of the million dollar question that has come up again and again. And and part of it is that you know like if I'm a developer, I can develop in Chittenden County for the and build a unit for the exact same amount of money but I can charge more for rent. And although our rents are high, they're not high enough to reach the breaking point where it becomes, um, uh, it makes more sense to, to develop here. And we saw that with Redstone. They said, you know, it's the, the costs are higher than what our return is. And, and you know, unfortunately, what we're going to have to see is higher rents before that market, you know, the market corrects itself or we have an intervention of some sort. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much for your work, Jack, and Thanks. Kevin, for your staff support. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I saw Jeff Byer come in, I believe. Jeff, you want to join us to talk about proposed Hubbard Park land purchase, or Hubbard, yeah, land purchase adjacent to Hubbard Park. So I'll talk in uh, general terms as I understand it. If we can talk Jeff, to you're going to have to move the mic. Here. Oh. <laughs> Stereo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll talk in general terms because I understand that land purchase issues uh, otherwise need to go into uh, executive session. But correct me if I'm I'm wrong. So um, to, just to address that question, yeah. Land purchases are are a, an a, a allowable topic of executive session when um, there is a, a clear disadvantage to the party 
So, for example, if we were discussing negotiating this purchase and we wanted to talk about, well, you know, offer this, but we'll take this and those kind of things, you would do that in open session. If you, in a situation where, the, the pro, if, if as, you're, as I understand you're presenting it, here's the price, here's the pro property, yeah. it's just do we buy it or not. Right. Um, it is, I, I don't know that it would meet that test of there being a disadvantage to the, the council mm -hmm. unless there was a negotiating point they wanted to discuss. Okay. All right. Um, so I think so just to yeah. follow up on that point, yeah. I think I'd leave it to your discretion to draw, tell us when you think that this an open session discussion would disadvantage the city in some way and that we could figure right. it out. Right. It sounds like mm -hmm. as a general matter, it's appropriate for us to talk about that in public. Great. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, Park Commission and I have been um, pursuing the potential for uh, a land addition purchase in Hubbard Park for several reasons over the past several years. Um, and a couple of them being the continuing growing pressures on Hubbard Park and some conflicts of use and then having some more uh, choices to do more. And the two particular uh, things that are, uh, offer possibilities are one, having uh, a trail that would be a leash or no leash thing. Because when you have historic uses, it's, uh, I think you probably can relate and you try to change them, it's, it's a lot harder than if you have a new piece and then you have a, a, a new use. And we saw that in North Branch uh, Park when we established a multi-use trail, there was absolutely no resistance and it's welcomed and it's been very uh, popular for, for everyone. If you try to do that same thing, we've had people come to meetings very upset and concerned with a possible conversion uh, of a trail to a multi-use in Hubbard Park um, when uh, mountain bikes are brought up. Uh, so with the, with the new trail, we would have that option, not that either of those are set in stone. The Park Commission would want to get the land and then have public meetings and then try to get the highest and best use given community input. So that's the rough background. Um, so we have walked this, 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 this <coughs> land. I've been in conversation with the landowners for ooh, actually over four or five years. And, uh, and now f in this past year, uh, finally, both landowners were willing and interested and agreed up uh, to a uh, fair market appraised value. Uh, we got the appraisal and they both agreed to uh, the price of the appraisal. So, and that's why I'm here today to seek your approval to go forward uh, with this purchase in part, in, in large part, using park impact fee money uh, that is still available. Background. Questions for Jeff? Not a question, but a thank you. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks. Great. I have uh, a feeling I'm going to be um, in the minority here, but I am going to be opposed to this purchase. Um, and the reason is that I have taken a look at where our parkland is in the city, and I think there's a real inequity. Um, and it's my, you know, my own district, District 1, has an abundance of parks yeah. um, and the other districts district 3 in particular but um, you know going out uh, the further reaches of district 2 as well um, have no parks no playgrounds um, there is no place in walking distance that you know a family can can take their kids for a public playground or um, you know that there's public park access and the use of this $14,000, that closes out this fund. And we're going to see some real budget constraints over the next 10 years. Um, we heard the other day about an anticipated $100,000 to $400,000 um, increased need in aging infrastructure in the wastewater recovery facility per year over the next 10 years. In addition, we've heard um, over the, the past few months about how over the next 15 years we're going to see uh, our retiree population go from um, one third, sorry, one sixth of the population to one third of the population. And so um, we are going to have a, that much greater of a population that's on a fixed income and our ability to increase property taxes to pay for these services is going to really decline. So I'm very concerned that if we spend this money now, this is kind of our last shot at acquiring new parkland, I think. I don't think that there's going to be appetite in future councils to spend more money not just appetite but ability you know we may want to do those things but we're not going to be able to because we're going to have these real pressing infrastructure needs and so 
I can't justify spending that last $14,000 to add to a park in an area of the city that already has so much access while, you know, pot potentially precluding, um, you know, maybe uh, adding some parkland along the future bike trail um, to put a playground over there, um, maybe doing a playground up in the Berlin Street area, uh, maybe purchasing a piece of Saban's pasture if that were to become available to us. And by spending this money now, and I've checked with Bill, and there's no deadline for us to spend this money, we can continue to hold it in our, in our pocket um, until one of those real pressing needs comes up. But by spending this money now, we're preventing ourselves from being able to address that inequity in the future. Um, so I, in spite of the fact that, you know, I would love to see um, <coughs> some additional uses added to Hubbard Park, um, I don't feel that I can support this purchase. I attended the park commission with the bicyclists. John was at the whole meeting. I came in late. But I really understood from the bicyclists doing mountain biking how much they actually travel city to city, state to state, hunting for trails that are significant. And I've heard a lot about bikes wanting right away to the park. And I'm one of those old users that prefer them not to come into the path paths that are now exi existing. So I see this as part of a real economic development. I mean, these are bicyclists that will come in and stay at our hotel and spend <coughs> money. Um, so I'm, I'm leaning to supporting it. It's not that I don't want to see more parks everywhere, but this is an opportunity that doesn't come very often to get more land. So Thank you, Dolly. I'm in support I'll just of follow it. up on that. There is a trails committee uh, chaired by Tim Flynn and there are a number of members on it. I'm, I'm been involved in that as well to look at how we can create a more robust mountain bike and multi-use trail network around Montpelier and just to follow up on Donna's point it is a significant economic driver of activity in uh, Stowe, Waitsfield, Northfield and then of course the Northeast Kingdom is kind of the poster child for the Northeast if not the U.S. Uh, that we have really missed out on here and uh, so there's a large group of, of mountain bikers and then just not even talking about the recreational benefits for residents here to have and so there's a real link a missing link so a couple of things I used to talk for a while about that but just to focus on this parcel there's a real missing link from downtown there's really no way to get from on a mountain bike from the downtown really anywhere and this is an opportunity to avoid the kind of challenges uh, mixed con uh, conflicts of users that exist by creating another route that would then go out towards the north branch and then there's a, a proposal now to build a trail network on the, in the north branch park which is pretty exciting and that could be a real a magnet for uh, people from the region so this is a, a real a critical piece I think to that whole project <coughs> thank you and if I can respond to a couple of your concerns um, because this is something that the Park Commission and I have thought through a while and, and I really appreciate your your interest in serving other neighborhoods and that's I, I will want you all to really know that is high on the Park Commission and my list and we've actually sought to do that a, a couple times and have, have been restricted from funding because one of the questions funders want to know is not as is this the idea of the Park Commission and I to do something? They want to know there's actually city support for something. And until just this last year, the Park Commission had a, had a green plan plan. Now the Conservation Commission has signed on, and they actually I believe the Planning Commission has now accepted that as, as a document that, that makes it uh, um, part of, of official city <coughs> plan to serve more neighborhoods. So that enables us to do this fundraising we've been restricted from doing because we haven't had a, a, a city document to this date. So now we're freed up to do that. Um, before that, uh, just to, to hopefully to reassure you, um, uh, we added in the time I've been here, when, when I first got here, it was 125 acres, there's now 400 acres. We added uh, over uh, 200 acres with only $2,000 of city funds. So this, this does not represent the, the capacity of the city to uh, serve other neighborhoods. There is a number of funding sources when when it's clear that a city there's a city need and a city service that that, that will fund the purchase uh, of, of lands and the park commission and I have been understood and maybe I'm incorrect and from what I understand of the park impact fee but our reading is that 
that the park impact fee isn't used within a certain amount of time, it, uh, it, it can be uh, returned to the uh, users now if they, I mean, if they request it. So it makes it vulnerable and um, so it, 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 otherwise it right, otherwise we keep it. So there's a certain amount of vulnerability, it's, it's unlikely, but it's, um, uh, but this is an important project uh, and it, it, it's to the park commission tonight, it seems like the best use. So is it, so it's fair to say that a large portion of the acres that we've added were funded through um, other sources, gr uh, those are grants? Yes. Um, okay, so. Yes. Okay. And there, to, to be honest, there may be, with the current administration, there may be, it may be harder to access some yes. of those funds. Uh, <laughs> John? Oh, sorry, John. You mentioned maps. At the commission meeting, they talked about the green print. Yes. And it would be really helpful to share with the whole council the comprehensive look that the commission does of the whole city. Yes. The Park Commission has looked at the city from, uh, and the Conservation Commission from a couple I've, of different views. I've looked at the green that. print. Yes. And, and that's where I'm getting my, you know, oh my gosh, yes. why are we focusing all of this effort on, and money on just this one portion of the city? Um, right. it, it's clear from that green print that there is a huge amount we could be doing um, for the rest of the city. And, and we plan on doing it, and the, the, we plan on doing it. That's part of uh, Well, I'm just telling plan. you that this is kind of the last money I think you'll be able to get from the council on that. Yeah. So, and that's, it's, it's not, is this a good thing? Is, it's, is this the best thing that you can do with that $14,000? Right. And the last thing I'll say on that, uh, unless I'm asked, is, is part of what we want to do is the Hubbard Park is not just a neighborhood park, but it's really a, it's the park in Montpelier that attracts people. It's listed on TripAdvisor as a, one of the top reasons to visit uh, um, Montpelier. Um, it's it's really attractive. We attract people from out of state, all over the town. They come to the tower. They come there, and, and one thing we want to do is make sure we take care of that well before we add new parts to this well. And right now, there's a certain amount of complex, and it's our, our estimation to take care of it well. This is this is needed to reduce the complex. Well, it looks to me like this is the sort of deal that probably takes a while to put together, and you're being been very patient waiting and to find. Uh, acreage that's directly abuts existing park at a price of just under $2,500 an acre yeah. seems like a pretty good value to me and I have no doubts that the parks director will um, use his drive and creativity to ensure that um, other uses like bicycle usage or reducing conflicts in the park uh, will happen on this land. Uh, I'm comfortable moving to authorize the parks department to move forward with the purchase of private property adjacent to Hubbard Park. I'll second it. Is there further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, Rosie, appreciate you raising your concerns. I know that's not always easy to do, and, but anyway, it's helpful. With thank you all. Thought, so. Thank you, Jeff. OK, um, move to budget workshop. So, um, you know, I sent out an email earlier today. We don't have a set plan. It's really what you guys want to do. I didn't know if we wanted to move down to the table, have the folks come up to the front row. Um, we emailed out a bunch of presentations. We're not planning to go through them unless anybody would like us to. Uh, but that was there to prompt any questions that people have. And, you know, we so it didn't seem to be a long list of questions that we were asked before the holidays. So we just got, I think, everybody here and uh, willing and interested. I mean, I'll just say, to say, I think you've done a great job putting this budget together. I don't want to create an expectation that we're going to spend a huge amount of time, you know, dissecting it, because it seems to me you've met the council's objectives we set out, you know, set a give a <laughs> budget within a certain figure that meets the council's policy objectives, and it seems to me you've done that. So, I mean, I don't want to foreclose any discussion, but I also don't want to create an expectation that we need to 
always spend days and well, believe me, Mr. Weir, we're not we're not demanding that you <laughs> spend a lot of time. I'm, not, I'm just sort of saying that generally. I'm sure you would be happy. <laughs> but we uh, we certainly understand it's our duty that the you know you folks will once you adopt this budget it becomes the council's budget, not the manager's budget. And to the extent that people have questions and want to learn more about it, um, you know we want to make sure we're available and set the side time aside tonight with nothing else on the agenda to have that conversation to the extent that you want to have it. Sure. Justin. So, oh, you want to set? To would we rather set in the? Do you, Donna? Did you want to move? To the I like that, but I know how resistant you are. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I just <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe a brief discussion. Well, I don't know what it's going to be. Uh, well, first let's just. Uh, I guess I would just echo what you said, that this feels like a really smooth and functional budget process from my perspective. We've set a goal, and city managers achieved that goal of 1.9 with the assumption of a half a percentage growth in grand list. Uh, and additionally, the scheduled increase to capital improvements is included in this budget. Um, I'm feeling really positive about this process right now. I'm happy to take any presentations, or, but I'm pretty comfortable. Well, maybe just to kick it off I, I would remind you that there's two you know I sent out the email one of them is $800 item for Wrightsville um, right you know, we can either just add it or I don't think that's a big deal but we did get the request for 28,200 from Central Vermont Public Safety Authority uh, and I assume that they would want to come and talk about that but that is not in the budget so if that were to be considered that would be a new item in the budget just to be clear about that and we do have Green Mountain Transit scheduled for the 24th that's the only time they could make it. They were on the last meeting. We bumped them because of zoning. They couldn't make it tonight or next. And week. that's the night that we would have. That's to the final vote. So yeah. So I guess it, I would. So I did ask them to give us some written information yeah. on, um, on that. So just those are pending items. Okay. That are, yeah. I really feel like we need to hear from the CVPSA if they're if they're now asking for a budget allocation. I'm not comfortable, given they, where they plan to come in. Do we know when? <coughs> that, we just got the email. You know, I got. We, I was out last week. It came in last week. I just forwarded it to you. But they, right. we, we would need to schedule them. It would have to be either next week or yeah. I, the I, following I, I'm not comfortable voting to allocate funding without hearing what the plan is because <coughs> I, I mean, there is no plan right now that any of us. I, I don't think the council has been made aware of any new plan. I read something in the Times Argus several weeks ago now, but that's all I've heard. So if there's any request for more funding, I think they need to come with a pitch. In, in this point, uh, before, because I had a kind I of agree with that. I just, out uh, of respect for the department heads, if, if I think we should use the focus this time, and, and if they do wish have present any relevant information, um, but certainly I'm happy to have those conversations about specific uh, unknowns that the city manager has recommended in this proposal. I just wanted to make sure. Headline? Or and I, I just want to add my voice to that, perhaps a stronger one, uh, because I know there have been concerns at Barry, but just to say I will strongly oppose any effort to put that funding on the ballot. I haven't seen any any uh, rationale offered for it, and I think this is now um, a board that's in search of a mission. Uh, the original mission hasn't shown itself to uh, uh, pan out, and there's no other communities that seem to be willing to support it. And I would strongly oppose funding. Now, I don't. Sammy said that. I'm not sure we have any role. That's right. Do we? The, the, the board. So <laughs> right. it will be a, a matter of you know just making comments to the public. I kind of now, looking in hindsight, kind of w regret having ceded that authority because I think uh, it looks like it's. I don't feel like it's being proposed responsibly to be funding uh, something that is far afield from the original mission of the authority. So I would just uh, join the concerns that have been expressed in Barry and say, from my perspective, uh, I don't think it's a well thought out plan. And I, I would strongly oppose, uh, uh, funding for that, uh, continued funding for the authority. Uh, Donna. Um, uh, the public safety authority has reached out and tentatively agreement with the capital uh, mutual aid on which the Capital West dispatch <coughs> contracts are from so that we would have a three party we would be bringing them into the Public Safety Authority to join Montpelier and Barry if they stay in uh, and then what the Capital West group is is about 
I'm going to say 31 towns, 28 towns, it's somewhere in there, towns that have joined together for fire departments as well as for dispatch through the Capital West contract that Montpelier Dispatch Police handle now. But the agreement would be that the mutual fire aid, the Capital West mutual fire aid, would be the mm -hmm. municipal joining us and we would work together on infrastructure of towers and equipment and that from there we would hope then to integrate more services. So there is a plan that's going to be coming towards you and it is true we prefer to have the support of the councils but we are our own entity and hence we can go on the ballot without your support which we prefer not to. And what that amount is is just to have the administrator there to facilitate the joining of mutual FAR and a no FAR and mutual aid that's the name along with then going into the bonding and the bonding then is a commitment that we would have all the towns long term instead of on these short contracts that we now have. So that's a short story. Okay. And that's I think the concern is that it's January 3rd and we're being asked to propose or at least to act on respond to a proposal that we still haven't seen in you know, the, the few short weeks and it just seems to me that is indicative of the problem with this authority that I mean I, it was well intentioned I don't want to begrudge the incredible amount of work that went into you know, trying to make this work but fact is it just hasn't and I think at some point we need to stop putting good money after bad and say this was an experiment that we tried to make work it didn't and let's uh, you know call it a day so question. anyway okay so shall we if I can get them for next meeting or people work out in the next week. Yeah. I have some thoughts on other parts of the budget if, if, uh, if we just want to jump right in sure yeah. Um, so I was concerned, we heard repeatedly um, that the building inspector is going to be over capacity this year. And that's one that it seems like a pretty, hopefully an easy solve because if, the, if there are more things that need to be inspected, we're getting more fees in. So should that happen, we should have additional revenue. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what our plan is for that. So um, could we use those, could we plan to use, if there's increased demand, increased fees, could we plan to hire a, a temporary or contract inspector or could we contract with a neighboring city or town to um, use their inspector for I, I just want to know this seems like an, an issue and I want to know what our plan is so we did spend a lot of time on that both you know, Bob and Michael both here um, we we don't have any uh, funding in the budget for that we did anticipate some new fees um, some will hit this year some you know some are actually going to hit during this current fiscal year um, when they pay the building fees, even though the, the inspections won't carry forward to the next year. Um, the strategy that we left our team with was Bob actually was working to get certified in building inspection and to provide assistance that we're already handling. Um, and there's always going to stretch some things at the mm -hmm. fire department. We want to do it within, to see if we could do it within that way, within existing resources. but. I think a fallback plan would be to come back to the council at some point with revenue surplus and say we, we need to hire on. But that was a, a one of the lengthier parts. For, for the new council members, by the way, we, we, we've changed the way we do our budget in the last few years. We used to be the traditional everyone handed in a budget and we went through it all. And now we basically, I joke, but we don't actually lock it, but we put everybody in a room for about two days and it's all decided together and there's a lot of. Uh, it's actually great to, listen, to watch people say, you need this more than I do, and um, it's, it's really worked very well. But So the, our team struggled with this one, and that was where we came down. But I, they're both here if they want to speak more directly to it. Yeah, just, um, currently I'm scheduled to get the training. The first, right now, the first two weeks of April at the National Fire Academy, what we're doing at the um, Vermont Division of Fire Safety, who traditionally has taught those classes, that's where Chris got his training was through them. Uh, they're not putting on a class this winter, um, but they're looking uh, around New England to see if there's something sooner than April that I can get into. Okay. So that I would also be certified. Great. I just wanted to flag it because it kept coming up as a concern, and and we'd heard it, you know, prior that this was going to be an issue. So I wanted to make sure we had a so plan. Our thought then would be when, when I did then the major projects would fall to Chris. So Chris would do one Taylor Street, he would do those. 
I would then pick up the smaller, the decks and the garages and, the, and you know, throughout the summer. I, I would be responsible for the smaller projects. Um, it would relieve Chris of his health officer. Chris is now the deputy health officer. It would relieve him of his deputy health officer duties, and I would take all of those. And, um, Bob is currently the health officer. Right. So right. Yeah. That's not clear. So, so we're, we're looking for a way to relieve Chris so that he can then focus just on those five or six main projects. In the and I would. Okay. That sounds reasonable and acceptable. I just wanted to talk for a second. It's about disappointing that. just the way the budgets work for for the, the funding as it comes in because you know there's a chance we could get a really large amount of money in fees. I mean it could be you know two hundred thousand dollars in fees that we could collect, which would be more than enough to hire another full time person. But mm -hmm. you know if all those applications come in in April, May, and June. Then they're all in this fiscal year, but we need somebody for next fiscal year. And when we open that. those books, we don't have the money because the money was actually booked in last year's books. Well, I, there's ways we can do. That. I guess, yeah, I would press that we would reserve that and. Yeah. So <laughs> we th we think there's ways of, of making something, of having possibilities. But we didn't we didn't find a solution, but. Okay. We did well, want we to did. make sure you were aware. We do <laughs> we're have not sure how great it is. But well, and I, <laughs> there was also a mention in one of the memos about how the, the junk car ordinance um, and the nuisance building ordinance was increasing workload. And so I would be curious at some point um, to hear back from you um, about, Bob, about how much that was, um, you know, how many man hours that that was actually adding. Um, and, you know, the council had expressed some willingness to reconsider some of those um, in the future, if it was proving too difficult, so yeah, I, I can talk to Chris about that. <coughs> and keep it in mind that the fig is gone. Mm -hmm. you no, know, that took a lot of Chris. The Econolodge took a lot of Chris's time. So that you know that has been cleaned up. Um, the, I think it's 34 Berlin Street, the house you know, that has been taken care of. We're actively pursuing a solution to the situation on this Route Two, the Route Two Gallison Hill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're actively pursuing some you know, means of getting that cleaned up. And you recall the strategy that you all agreed to? We sort of prioritized the projects when we work at one, when one gets cleaned up, and move on to the next one. So we're not really trying to handle multiple mm -hmm. properties. And I don't think we've had a lot on the junk cars. We just had the one. We, got we just had one. Yeah. And I just saw it mentioned in one of the memos. So. Right. Yeah. And we get a, you know a, an occasional complaint from a neighbor of junk. Um, we had one on Hubbard Street that we were able to, to take care of. And so, you know, right now we're able to take care of them as they come in. You know, the big, you know, the three big ones, two of them are taken care of. And, you know, we have that situation that we're, we're trying to come up with a solution. It's, it's a difficult. And, and the concern in the memo is really just to address the fact that moving into a, a busier workload season means an already stretched mm -hmm. thing means that this may be something that just get, gets almost no attention when Caledonia Spirits and French right. Block and the hotel and One Taylor Street are all being inspected, that that maybe nothing happens in response to complaints. Well, I would just, um, and I assume others as well, would be interested in, in hearing back from you, you know, if that turns out to be an issue. And um, please, please give us your, your feedback on that. Yeah, and I, and I feel comfortable that this summer I'll be able to. And there's a few shifts going, you know, going to shift a few of my duties to uh, Chris Hatburn, who is our They probably don't safety. know Chris. <laughs> Chris is the public safety administrator, works um, part-time, or full-time, shared between police and fire. She does ambulance billing, sh shifting some of what I do to um, admin Chris. stuff. Great. Yes. So that was the only specific concern that I had. If others want to, if there's anything, I have two other things I wanted to talk about. But I just wanted to acknowledge the Community Justice Center. I learned today uh, through my other life during the day that uh, the CJC is starting some new desperately needed programming in the Washington County area. And I, I really commend the CJC for that, and I commend the council over the years for investing um, in that uh, the programming will be uh, for domestic violence uh, offenders, and it's such a necessary 
thing that we need here in Washington County, um, and the CJC here is stepping up to fill the need. So I, I, I appreciate that. Congratulations, I had a small um, police facilities uh, question or proposal and just wanted to verify with the chief. I know that um, earlier this year um, there was a little bit of concern around um, some facilities condition issues. I'll just say my own uh, in regards to three basic issues, but I wanted to just confirm that these were either being addressed or that you as a team had made a decision that they weren't a high enough priority to make it in this budget or if this council should um, be considering making any adjust small adjustments to accommodate these. The first being um, the flood resilience. And I think that um, without actually putting a rubber cap on a pipe, there's a sump pump in an elevator shaft that if there was power being supplied with our generator, we have redundancy there with the generator, um, that we wouldn't have any water problems in the lowest levels of the police station. Um, but there's a possibility that if, well, anyways, that there's a possibility that water could enter the police station was one. The other is if that happens, there's uh, a fair amount of electronics, computers and, and servers that are on, on that lower level um, and that potentially are vulnerable to those floodwaters if there was some sort of a crisis or emergent emergency situation, it would be really important that we probably have those, you know, those those would be remain intact and it would be fairly expensive to replace. At the time, it sounded like uh, that there was a cost associated with relocating some of those electronics, uh, maybe to a, a higher story or to the top story, uh, with the cost of, at the time, I think around under $100,000 or $10,000, certainly. Um, and then lastly, that there were some ceiling tiles that had water damage and, and well, well-worn carpet uh, in the station. I just wanted to raise those issues again and it, you know, find out if those were included in this budget cycle or if those had been excluded. Well, they, they, uh, much of that, for example, as of even right today, the community room is being repainted. Um, and that's, gonna, that's happening right now. Then when that is done, new carpeting will be in the community room. Uh, uh, last year, we already recarpeted the patrol room, and then uh, we did the full remodel of, of communications. The uh, completing that project uh, is part of that money is also concluded in this year's six thousand dollars, I believe, in this year in uh, FY19. Um, so that'll at least have uh, the carpeting project complete. As for the uh, flood hardening. Um, we did a lot of, with thanks to Public Works, did a lot of research and tried to evaluate what was happening. Uh, so, for example, in the May flooding, which is a flash flooding situation that we had in 2011, uh, May of 2011, uh, that was when Barry City Public Safety became an island, and we had two fire department, fire department had two pumps going in our basement, and we were heavily concerned at a lot of uh, things happening. We identified that problem, and just per, from a perspective, uh, the water level was 17 feet down at the cemetery gauge during that flood. That was a substantial flood. Downtown was flooded, if you recall. Um, and then when Irene hit, um, after we've identified the problem, we were bone dry. And we were 19 feet <coughs> from the water during Irene. Um, so, uh, we, so we we did do what we can. There's, there's no electronic sitting on the ground. There was a proposal in place that was not acted on as far as our landlines. And the, and the computer equipment that supports those. Much of that, inform, much of that system has since changed, um, and uh, to re but we have not re relocated all of the electronics um, upstairs. Our radio system itself, though, is upstairs, uh, is on the second floor. So, um, so but as far as that, I'm pretty confident that we are in, in uh, um, pretty, pretty, pretty good shape as far as that goes. Right now. Uh, I guess it's not really a question so much as, um, I mean, I know the, um, all, all the departments really do great work. Um, uh, one of the things that I uh, would love to see, and I don't, this is like one of the few times a year that we see you get to talk about things in general. Um, and so I'm just going to put my plug in for more graphs. Uh, just, I want more data about like <laughs> how, how we're doing sure. um, as a city. And I don't necessarily I didn't see need that right now. see those in our report. Did I miss it? No. Um, oh, okay. But 
I, I save them. I save them for the annual report. Okay, fair, fair. Um, so yes. We but have. I do. I do love. I do love. You know, the more graphs, the better. <laughs> um, some real quick highlights. Uh, you know, looking now that I have a full year, and unfortunately we had the armed robbery on the 27th. So we, Montpelier, we kicked off uh, 2017 with a murder. Uh, awesome. Um, Marcus Austin, and then we almost ended up when we ended up with an armed robbery. Uh, but everything in between was uh, it, it was really good. Um, so, for example, burglary across for the entire year cut in half, 50 percent. Our total crime rate in Montpelier is down 13.3 percent. Um, these numbers are just absolutely outstanding. Uh, this is the first year in three years we have not had an, uh, an overdose fatality that we. Um, so it's. It's things are um, overall coming, doing, coming together. Considering, you know, we technically have been understaffed for a year uh, as well. But there's some other things that we've had in place and some partnerships that have allowed us um, to be successful on the police side. But in any community, the police don't get all the credit for that. I mean, that's just one piece. It's, but it's certainly our primary responsibility is to do what we can to control crime. Uh, but it's everything from, you know, well-engineered streets, lighting. Uh, but really a, an involved community. That's where like Coffee with Coppice has been such an important program for us. Saving the skunks that were trapped in the yogurt cups was really... Those are those that, human, those are those those human interest stories. That, I really that was so like much. the highlight of my Facebook um, viewing that day. That, you know, um, so, but it's just, and, and I just want to say that it, all of that comes together, uh, you know, the rec department, you know, everything, and that's why, back to when Bill talked about the Budget Congress, we're so proud of it. Just, how we, we do this because we know that it's not just any one of our departments that make Montpelier unique, um, that it's it's how it all fits and, and that's something that we're, as all department heads, we're proud of. So, but those are some of the real big highlights um, from from the crime, the crime scene uh, stuff. Um, and uh, so I, but I think the real concern uh, and it hasn't really changed that much this year from last year, but the, it's what's on the horizon. Um, it's it's not it's you know it's somewhat bleak um, from the randomness of, of mass violence uh, to the resources of, of you know how do we keep how do we keep supporting special events in Montpelier? Um, most are are non crime related and are, are very peaceful, but that might not may not always be the case. And our officers are getting burnt out. Um, you know, they're not, they have not have weekends sometimes when, when we've had, and this winter was particularly bad, uh, just a lot from, from a political standpoint and a lot of protests, a lot of rallies from climate to, of course, the, the Women's March that there may be an annual, <laughs> annual event. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, anticipating not to the same magnitude. But nonetheless, uh, you know, the first things that we did after the Women's March, we, we uh, we had uh, Homeland Vermont Homeland Security Emily Harris um, do an after after action review, um, and I had just talked to as many people as I could from uh, you know our Secretary of Commerce, former Burlington Police Chief uh, Chief Sherling, and said like how, how did you do it when you had you know forty thousand people on the waterfront? Um, and he said well I got a lot of parallel cities uh, streets around there, yeah you know, a lot of things that we just don't have in Montpelier. Um, so. Those are those are real concerns. Uh, you know, NYPD, uh, New York City is just at, is adding 1,500 uh, you know bollards uh, to prevent vehicular assaults on various streets. I know there's always uh, conversations that pique a lot of interest in Montpelier. But hey, at some point, do we make you know part of State Street? Uh, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a minor, a mini Church Street. Uh, you know, a lot of that has um, you know a lot of safety potential uh, to the for the better. Um, but these are these are considerations. I mean, we haven't. Everything we do is based on what is the intelligence, what information do we have at the time. Um, so you haven't seen, uh, you know, a fleet of uh, sand-laden dump trucks. Um, that could happen at any time in Montpelier. We need to be prepared for that. It's my responsibility as well as you know, uh, Chief Gowans. Uh, when we look at any of these big events, uh, what's at stake, and we have to you know, really be thoughtful. Um, and at the same time. Not also creating a you know anything that's going to have too much it's that balance of, of a military state uh, of uh, to to what makes Montpelier unique and it's uh, and it's, it's it's balance and it's uh, you know I do the best I can to get it right um, and we've got an, a, and so 
So that that is uh, the, you know the technology and, and also how long it takes to get a qualified police officer um, and dispatcher you know up and trained when we lose one. Um, you know the vacancy that we we, we have we're going to be filling uh, with it by tra by taking up a dispatcher who wants to be a police officer, and um, you know so that'll be happening this year. Uh, but but that vacancy occurred in June of 2017. And by the time she's done field training in the police academy and on her own, will be the fall of, of 2018. Um, and then also we have retirements on the horizon um, within, you know, less than three years. Uh, you know, the, the, one of our detectives will be retiring, I anticipate, sometime this year. That's a lot of experience. Uh, you know, I'm going to be retiring within three years. The captain's going to be retiring within three years. And um, so also, I'm just concerned that do we have the right number of officers, um, as well as uh, we have been able to ever so slightly but increase bike patrol. Uh, we have two officers now that are on the bike, um, and that's something there was a time when we had three officers dedicated to bike patrol. Uh, so it's, uh, um, and although crime is, is on the decline right now, but again, we have to always make sure what can we, what's going to be sustainable long term, and that's where the challenge really comes from. As far as do we have the number of officers, and, and um, you know, I've, I've ex expressed multiple times to the city manager and to uh, during the budget con uh, budget congress process that you know for F FY20, um, you know, we'll be asking for a 17th police officer and understanding what that means financially. Um, Tony, I'm really <coughs> glad that your graphs or data are, are so positive. I, with safe catch and with mm -hmm. all the opiate addictions. How is that going? You said no deaths, but what's the rest of the story? Well, we have a, a meeting coming up next month uh, with all the medical. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a, I think it's quarterly. Uh, Chief Bumpier will be joining me on that one as well. Uh, but, but the last uh, word that I had from Deborah Hopkins, who's the, the director of the runs for Sutherland Substance Use Services, that they have, they were, they were pl plateaued. In other words, um, you know, they're not seeing an increase of those seeking seeking treatment, and they're meeting the demand. Um, so people are getting into counseling. Well, it's, yeah, but there's so many people that we just don't know if they're making it to counseling. And and where <coughs> the other challenge that we always have is that, you know, is there's still a breakdown when they get to corrections. Um, that do they get the psychological, the mental health support, mm -hmm. and do they get the substance, you know, uh, treatment that we have, you know, we have drug court, uh, their safe catch, um, and, and uh, as I told this council many months ago, um, after the, the, you know, some that the Vermont Intelligence Center asked, what were we doing differently because of our burglary stats alone? And, and then I also talked to Dr. Uh, Max Schluter about, you know, who's a criminologist. And, um, and uh, as far as what's happening, the only real thing that we off plan, you know, program that we've done differently was safe catch. I said, don't discount that. Even though our numbers may not even have I mean, they're really. But it's a presence. They're, it's they're an really, exactly, and it, it really, um, you know, it's something that we're really proud of in Montpelier that we started it here. Uh, thanks, thanks to Bill and a, and a, and a 60 Minutes clip uh, with Chief Campanello in Gloucester. Um, so, and and, uh, and, I, and that and what the success that we have had here that's been relayed to to Burlington PD and and even to the governor himself directly by him. So, um, it's. It's firing on all cylinders again to make sure that we're a healthy community. And uh, you mentioned a bit about all the demands of the state house and being here and the protests, the marches. And at one point, we asked you to keep track of mm -hmm. overtime related because I think we really need to put that into our pilot discussions. Heavy time is it so unreasonable for us to hold the full responsibility and cost of that? Right. Have you got any numbers on that overtime, or can you well, get it we, to us we, eventually? Uh, well, we just gave a, I give Bill a snapshot of our overtime itself, not just more of the special events. Yes, um, okay, special so, events. So okay. uh, one of the things I will say is that the state police and uh, the cap and the new chief at the cap with at the state house, uh, but they've they've really picked up the pace, especially the Vermont State Police in the last several years, um, because. You know, we certainly have been tapping into their resources, uh, special teams, um, things like that, more than uh, with our protests and, and our and some of the. Uh, uh, we had a 
rolled an armored vehicle into Montpelier for the first time last uh, last New Year's Eve, not this, this New Year's Eve, but uh, New Year's Eve 2016. Um, so we definitely, it's been a good relationship, and I don't feel overworked there, but it's just when you have 20,000 people or even 10,000 people or, what's, or if there's a problem associated with that, even all the state police, I mean, there's 330, you know, there's just not a police officer to be around. And it's a chronic problem throughout Vermont. Vermont, historically, uh, we have some of the smallest ratios of law enforcement, it's my understanding, um, for some of the, the, you know, it's just we're underfunded here. Um, but because of some of the other challenges that we don't have, we, we've been made it work. But, um, so it's gotten a lot better. As a matter of fact, Chief, the fire chief and I will be sitting in a command post tomorrow for the state of the state. Um, but the role is really, um, you know, we're there, but really as a support, we're not, we're not, it's not, you know, it's not my baby anymore kind of thing. So. I mean, you had talked uh, about staffing and getting police officers, and it's very hard to get police officers and dispatchers, and mm -hmm. every police department in the region has the same issues, and you borrow and steal right. from one another, and the hope was regionally that would be be better to pull it all together and to have a s more sizable department and more professional development. So that is still hovering out there as one of the positive of the regional system. Yeah, uh, there's a, uh, it's going to, it's Senate S-273. It's going to be a bill that's proposed for the session that talk about, it's basically uh, uh, springboards off the, the work that was done by Senator Jeanette White when she went around and talked about public safety around the state. And there is a, a lot of things there. Uh, I know Bill and I were there for the, the and Paco was there for the, uh, that once, the last one they had it back in November, to talk about regionalization anyway, and we were not so much looking at the p police conversation, at least that was not our interest, as was obviously dispatch. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, uh, it, in some, in some regard, yes, that, you know, obviously a larger police department, you can do more with it. Um, but but also what is what are you also inheriting with that um, new geographic landmass? And, and what are their problems? What's their community makeup? Um, and and uh, so people have to be clear-eyed to what you know. Let's talk about the obvious. If we were to the Barry City, uh, it's a, it's two very different communities with very different needs and very different cultures, in both within the community as well as the police departments. Um, so there would be definite. Um, yeah, what you want changes in how some services have been delivered for a very long time could, could be impacted. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's like a bad thing, um, right. but, you, but when you do that, it has to be in such a way that your um, you know, understanding of there's going to be some changes. So, but you've also talked when there's burglaries there, there tend to be oh, absolutely. drug sales here. So there's a lot of problems <coughs> that we share, for mm -hmm. better or worse. And we are, even though we're all different, different departments, um, we work very closely with Barry City. We're extremely closely with Vermont State Police and our federal partners. Uh, and we have some very unique relationships right now that we've had the last several years, especially with uh, State Police and Drug Task Force and with ATF and FBI. Um, a lot of our drug crime, most of our drug crime is not even prosecuted out of the Washington County State's Attorney's Office. It's, it's being handled by the U.S. Attorney's, um, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Vermont and other states, as well as uh, the, the Attorney General because of the drug task force work, we're really push a lot of that. But um, so just because yeah. we're different departments does not mean that that cooperative, those cooperative efforts aren't happening. And you're still one staff under, even after you fill that position, right? You'd like to have one more. I would like to have one more, but we, we will be at our, 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 our authorized uh, uh, strength of 16 officers, you know, that are working out of that PD. Just, just to add quickly to that is that the, the problem of finding qualified police officers is not unique to Vermont nor to si you know size of it's, yeah. a, it's a national issue and actually we've been <coughs> probably more fortunate than others to be able to yeah. keep close to a full load I know there are other Vermont departments that are considered you know down multiple people and you know I talk to my colleagues around the country it's just something that comes up all the time because it's you know Look at the, the controversies, the stresses, the, the demands. It's a tough job, and um, you know, you can only pay so much. And even if you do, sometimes it's not about the money; it's about the disruption to your life, safety, and in you know, no matter what you do, someone's going to say you're doing it wrong. So it's a, it's not easy, and we appreciate what they do. Just 
I'd like to circle back to um, Project Safe Catch and also Coffee with a Cop and just express my strong support for this sort of work. It's so important to, you are really doing all the community building. That's probably part of the reason we're seeing the reduction in crime rates. Um, it ties right into 21st century policing, which I'm also strongly supportive of, um, particularly transparency and you know that openness with the community. And I didn't know uh, very briefly if it, um, you know, Facebook internationally has started to take some positions on either closing accounts or taking digital action in terms of uh, open and clear, transparent communication for a variety of reasons. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is, came actually from a constituent, but they were saying you can, um, the Montpelier PD Facebook page doesn't, as you can see how many comments have come in, right. but we, you've chosen not to do that. And I assume there's a very thoughtful and deliberate reason didn't know if that's part of so how you uh, could talk a little bit. Yeah, there's several reasons. One is um, it's to protect identity of victims of crime, uh, to also to make sure we're protecting the judicial process. Um, people are just playing nasty. Channel 3 took it off because it's all, you know, what you were seeing, just this you know, evil trolling. And, and the last thing you want to do is have a you know, person that may be, you know, uh, got reaction is this person is guilty of X crime and, and whatever, and that comments are made. Um, you know, and that may be a real built an innocent person. That's one side. The other is, um, you know, it is our it is our page. It is not intended to show absolutely everything that our department does. So that's why we choose to be constructive about it. Um, you know, we have a complaint process. So when there's a, a legitimate or perceived legitimate grievance or, or complaint, they can get a copy of the you know how to file a complaint. There's, they're available in the clerk's office, the city manager's office, our department. Um, so that part, uh, there is a clear, um, and it's in our policy mm -hmm. as far as that goes. But our social media is really just a way to push out information to the public. That makes a lot of sense in hearing you describe. There's a whole bunch of legitimate reasons why you would choose not to make those comments public. I'm somewhat naive in terms of uh, the suite of products that Facebook or other social media sites offer to federal, <laughs> state, or municipal um, law enforcement agencies. Does the current do we does the city currently have a portion of our budget that's being spent on information that you're receiving from social media sites? No. Okay. Is that something in the future that is well, offered I mean, or that you might um, want? No. We we looked at you know obviously we're part of the city's website and it's one of those areas of need to work on I need to work on or other folks. Um, We've got an incredibly talented and committed team on the Facebook piece. Uh, we, it's uh, Sergeant Nordenson oversees it, um, and we've got three other people uh, underneath that uh, to keep that going. Um, but a lot of it is with any of these technologies and, and any systems, um, they're, they're wonderful tools, especially for that, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the Twitter even. Um, but there becomes an expectation, you a public expectation of you know, are you receiving that information with that regularity? So suddenly, you know, and it has to be deep enough in terms of the people that are actually pumping out the information and receiving it and processing it. So you can't just have like one person, hey, I'm on vacation this week, and all of a sudden, boom, hey, what's Montpelier <laughs> PD doing? Um, so it's one of those things, there's there's so many yeah, and things I guess that we would like to do um, with technology that I just, again, I'm trying to balance what I, you know, sure, putting our the money where we can get the most bang for our buck um, in policing, so. Sure, and I, maybe I'd, I just want to make sure I was expressing myself clearly. Not so much uh, curiosity about like doing more social media posting or expressing, not that there's anything wrong with that, um, but other uh, digital tools that are or may be currently available for cell phone tracking or any number, any suite of new um, digital resources that we do have and are available and I just was curious if that was anything that we're currently considering or exploring or not more uh, just kind of right no, on the and a lot of a lot of the technology is being heavily controlled and regulated um, almost to, to the point of a detriment depending on depending on what side you sit on I mean if the ACLU is sitting right here the conversation uh, but we all know there's uh, what in, the, in particular uh, we don't have license plate readers in Montpelier um, and state police just phased them out because of the, they can't afford to just not that it's a bad tool, but they can't afford to keep up with the maintenance of these things. Again, the federal government pumped out a lot of it, money 
for some of the technology, but then the, now all of the maintenance contracts are on. Um, so, and we're not a borders, we're not a borders, you know, city. Uh, facial recognition with the permit motor vehicles, that was another, you know, the challenge. And, and drones is, is another one. Just um, with the prevalence of drones now, it's just absurd unless there's a, you know, an exited situation. We get the clear police department does not own a drone or we use a drone. Um, <laughs> And anything else that we do is, and any technologies that we may have are in, in uh, we, we would use that technology in full compliance with, with state and federal law. Thank you. Other questions for Glenn? Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. <coughs> Other questions for department heads? City manager? Yeah, where is it? Um, so I guess this is a Sort of for everybody, um, I noticed um, reading through the reports, um, the performance measures for some uh, were wonderful. And as particular, I wanted to highlight IT. I really liked those performance measures. They're clear. They're things that IT is responsible for. Um, and you can see, you know, if they um, accomplish them, then they're doing well. If they don't, then they're not. Um, there were some other performance measures included, though, that were things that departments didn't really have control over. Um, or were things where anything less than 100% would be complete failure. Um, so I just want to say for next year, um, to I'd like to see a little bit more um, tweaking of those um, so that they really reflect um, what the department specifically is doing um, and how well they're doing it versus other things outside of their control um, or just like the baseline job responsibilities. Um, so I'll just... just Go Thank ahead. you for actually for saying that with everybody listening. <laughs> um, we've we've struggled with performance measures um, since we've tried to implement it. Um, you know, we don't have just kind of what the chief was saying about um, you know keeping up with social media. We don't have a lot of staff to really spend a lot of time doing measure work the way it really <laughs> can be done well. Um, Jesse Baker was a sort of a performance measurement expert. It was a tool she brought with her from her prior position, so we tried to have her implement it and I, you know we didn't ever quite get it and we're still working on it but I think it's you know we I really see it as it's, it's a tool for the departments to manage themselves and I think mm -hmm. we're still struggling to find what's a reasonable amount of things to measure that's <laughs> actually useful to the departments that oh by the way has the added benefit that we report to the council and public and say here, here how we're doing on this and so we've gone in our discussions is, you know, all the way from let's just phase this out unless it's useful to you individually to let's pump it up and ramp it up. So we're kind of at that juncture right now. So we appreciate hearing that impact, whether it's useful. I, I do find them useful if they're things, you know, right. that, that um, mean something. That mean something. <laughs> in addition, the other, those other pieces of information can be useful data points, but I just, they're not. So, um, for example, uh, let's see. Um, the assessor's office says the number of buildings built. That's important information for us to know, but the assessor's office doesn't really have any control over the number of buildings built. So we're not going to judge them, you know, if there were fewer buildings and they can't really have a target for number of buildings built. So that sh should still be included in the reports, but not as a performance measure. Uh, would be my personal I opinion. I completely agree. <laughs> um, not to pick on uh, the assessor's office. No, I'll have them. <laughs> Doesn't it tell you what, how much time they spend? Don't they have to spend time on those? I think buildings? it's an important <coughs> data point okay. to know, you know, um, but I, I wouldn't judge them, you know, if, if their target was eight buildings built no, and we only had seven buildings built, That's not the they didn't point, fail. Right? I, just, I, no, I understand <laughs> that, but I'm just talking about how they spent their time yeah. and why they might not have done some, yeah. some other things because they had a busier year this year than last year. Yeah. Um, and then I wanted to make a comment that I noticed throughout there was a, a general feeling from the department heads that they were being asked to do more and we're, we're taking on more big projects. Um, and I felt that as well, kind of looking at our, our future. Um, and in a city that isn't growing in population, I think that, you know, we kind of have a responsibility um, to take a step back and say, well, we can't really do more. You know, I would love to have whatever amenities all over the city, but if we don't have a population that's growing to support that, we can't continue to add more projects and add more projects, all of which have all this enormous upkeep. Um, you know, they have ongoing costs. And so I just want to put it out there to the department heads that um, it, I think there is going to be a point that we need to kind of 
<coughs> reevaluate some of those things that we have been doing um, and take an honest look at, at future proposals um, if we don't grow in population um, to say, look, we can't do everything. Um, so if there are, you know, things that we have done in the past that you as department heads don't feel are um, continuing to benefit, you know, a large portion of the population um, next year when we come around to this point, I think it would be really um, helpful for the council to hear about those things. And I'm certainly really open to hearing about um, what can we let go of in order to allow us to continue to do everything we want to do. Um, so those are my comments. I'd like to hear from the community services, just if you parks and recreation and senior center, those are the three, right? Just, to, just, to, I just want to hear more personally. In reading this, it's a lot of very specifics, but it doesn't give me an idea about how you've experienced the past year <laughs> as this new form entity. I guess I want more of a subjective, uh, yeah, some yeah. comments. How has the year been as a as a unit, working together? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think um, <laughs> revisiting the primary goal of the community services integration was to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of the services that we're offering to the public. Um, and I think really on both of those fronts, um, we've been doing an excellent job. I think first and foremost, um, it sort of gave us the kick in the pants, if you will, that we needed to start working together more closely um, to better serve the public. Uh, we are now working very closely together. We meet regularly as a team. Um, both as the whole staff and as the leadership of the department. Um, we've consolidated administrative services, um, which has had a really positive impact on um, a customer calls up. They can now hear about all the services provided by all the departments with one phone call. We're sharing a database now that makes um, our work easier and uh, provides better uh, services to the public. Uh, we have one program guide that has all of the programs that we offer. <laughs> Um, and uh, we've been able to do more uh, together in terms of staffing. So um, where one department may not have had a specific expertise, like in facilities management or in fundraising, we've been able to share that across uh, the entire community services department. Um, also, when uh, one area has more demand at a certain time of year, uh, say during summer camp or recreation, we're able to shift our services because maybe that's wider time for one of the other staff people. Um, so we're able to flex um, in ways that we weren't able to before um, that have been really, really powerful and effective. That's that. Dan covered a lot there. Um, one of the other things that was that has come along too now is we can take credit cards in-house. Um, the, the senior center used to use the square, <coughs> but the system we have now with rec, rec track, we can actually run the credit cards right into the system so it goes right to the payment of the household that's made it and then we run a report at the end of the month and figure out the credit card fees that have been processed through the rec or through the senior center so now it's not doing two separate areas of figuring out how much credit cards came through um, the register that the senior center used to use it's all right in one database well and that's an example um of an area where one department was doing something in, in, in accepting credit cards and doing online registrations with credit cards, and we've been able to take that across. So now, yep. um, if you want to book a park shelter, you can pay with a credit card. Couldn't do that before. If you want to sign up for a rec program online and pay with a credit card, you can do that. There's no convenience fee. Yep. It's really um, easy for people. Oh, let's see, we had a great year in the, in the parks. And, um, See, we did our first ever summer park festival, which was uh, which was a wonderful thing. Uh, and people enjoyed that, and we had our best ever enchanted forest this year. It yeah. helped a lot of volunteers and the great cooperation from uh, Rec and, and Senior Center and uh, the community service customers it was really helpful in getting a record number of volunteers for us to, to pull up a great event, and the weather really helps too. Um, so that was great. Um, Hit this fall with the storm damage. Uh, we have uh, a lot of trees fall. Maybe, maybe a record of trees fall. We're still uh, cleaning up the damage in, uh, in, uh, in our spare time, <laughs> which means it's slowed down dramatically. Um, 
but uh, and it's looking like a good winter. Uh, it was a good year, a number of challenges, but we've had a lot of uh, volunteers and, and help in uh, and, uh, plugging, plugging away, trying to stay in town. So do, do you find some group marketing going on? And when I attend the Parks Commission meetings, I still feel like the Park Commission itself is so isolated. Has that improved? I remember Jesse Baker was there a couple meetings trying to <coughs> connect the commission more with other kinds of services that, that the city offers. Do you think they're getting support? The park commission, uh, I think the park commission is doing what they do <coughs> well. What I think potentially could be even better, and uh, we've talked about this, but we haven't tried it yet, is having a representative from each commission, uh, maybe even quarterly, with each other to yeah. improve some kind and look for other ways of cross-pollination to get some more hive mind going about how we can cross-pollinate good. Um, so that's uh, uh, something that uh, I think would be good to do and we've talked about doing it, but it has not been done yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just I remember not too long ago we were sitting around the table trying to frame out what this idea of community services might be and there was uh, understandably some apprehension about how that whole process would unfold and. I'm glad to hear that there are definitely sounds like some positive things that are coming out of this cooperation and synergy and also would hope that if there are parts that aren't working that you know need to be worked out or looked at again that please encourage you to come and let bill or whoever is appropriate to um, resolve those because with any new systems there are benefits and there are things that um, could be better so um, please feel free to do that and you know, really what you're doing is the icing on the cake here in Montpelier. If you ask most people what they like best about, about Montpelier, it's probably something that you guys have your finger on. So thank you for what you're doing. Good one. Well, if the weather keeps up, we should have an ice skating rink pretty soon. This <laughs> <laughs> out today and plowing the, the rink goes in tomorrow. Clearing it this morning. Yeah, yeah it's great. People are very excited about that, I'll just say. Yes. <laughs> it's not, uh, I haven't heard any dissension from no. the support for that, but other than the, well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> other than a few decision makers. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that, Arne, for your help yeah. with that project. Anyone, any other questions for these folks? No, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for all your work for the oh, residents. All right, other questions? Well, this might yeah. be a good time to talk about this since we seem to have a little bit of time. Um, is uh, we had had a conversation briefly about increasing the council's pay, and we talked about maybe increasing it. I think maybe John, you weren't here that night. I haven't been here for any discussion. No. Um, <laughs> so there was a, a brief <laughs> discussion about um, maybe increasing it at least to the amount where someone could pay a babysitter for the. Uh, number of hours that they were in actual meetings um, to try and make the council something that would be um, accessible for people from a wide range of walks of life to serve on. Um, and so I did a back of the envelope calculation that last year the council had um, full council meetings of about 110 hours. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there that I'd done that calculation. Now, of course, everyone is also serving on subcommittees as well, and that doesn't address all the hours that you spend reading and prepping for the meetings, um, but wanted to put that out there as a piece of information. I also asked uh, the high school kids what the going rate is for babysitters, <laughs> and they said it's $20 an hour. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> my kids are grown up. Yeah. Oh. Well, see, and that's just about, Anne said she'd like to earn as much as a city council member as she does as a coach. At the high school. Yes, I, I do. So that's eat, about in the same ballpark. As a coach. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Well, I'd be no. reluctant to wade in on this if I wasn't uh, not going to personally benefit from it as I would <laughs> have a pecuniary interest. But given that uh, I won't be serving after the next town meeting day, um, I will say that I think it is important uh, to allow people of all socioeconomic levels to participate. Um, the amount of time uh, that I personally have invested in this. Um, is uh, certainly eye-opening in terms of the commitment and what it takes to, to, to participate in this way. Um, certainly something that you have to want to do, uh, or no amount of money would probably make it worthwhile. Uh, using those two uh, pieces of 
information, it looks like it would put it at about 2200. Uh, sounds like what you're proposing. I suppose so. <laughs> but do we need to decide this tonight? Presumably the mayoral salary would be higher as well as it has been in the past, given that there's greater yes. responsibility. So what, what you will need to decide at some point is if you're going to add more money to the budget, and it, it is th those are specific ballot items, um, the amounts. So when we so we would have all of this has to be decided by the 24th. Why are those I, just the point of reference? Why why are they separate ballot items? Is it just political? I think. Has, it goes as far back as I can see. In, Is there any legal basis? For I think it, it was probably more of. I, I think it's done in most communities. I don't know what the legal basis is, other than, you know, rather than the council setting their own pay, they recommend it and the voters approve it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I don't. You know, the school board's on there too. Right. Although I don't you know if they will be under their new configuration. I certainly think it's best practice to put it before the voters. Um, they have a right to know. If, the people who are serving them are giving themselves a raise. Uh, I would just add anecdotally that this year, I believe, the city council's discretionary budget has been reduced by 50 or 60 percent, some significant amount, uh, which would more than cover, I think, in true dollars, the uh, proposed increase. It's essentially not increasing the cost to taxpayers as the savings will be found by reducing travel or other expenses that uh, what I don't know specific line items, but overall what uh, the council previously has been budgeted. And I was somebody asked if we I think to decide I'm wrong this about, tonight, I, and I think the answer was I no. think I'm wrong about twenty dollars an hour. I should go back and ask again. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. I mean, agree with I, that I used, part. To, I, I used to make more than that, and not much more than that, but more than that often, and that was almost ten years ago. But so please do continue to research. I'm gonna. I'm, <laughs> I'm not convinced about twenty, but um, yeah. Um, I would also say that from my position, I would rather that the council spend less money on meals for meetings and that kind of thing, you know, those sorts of kind of those extras, which I think are what makes up most of the council budget. I don't, maybe some of it's photocopying and that kind of thing. Um, so some of those more discretionary things, I would rather we take the money from that and put it into salary so that someone deciding whether or not they can afford to do this could look at that salary number and say, yes, I can make this commitment um, versus not knowing, you know, you're going to get your meal at the retreat paid for, that kind of thing. So I don't know what the math is on that. But. <laughs> well, well, part of the council's do. budget is also part of the cost allocation system. So is it not? Do, uh, is not the council? Because I saw some numbers about uh, staff time. So <coughs> <coughs> I I given also, what allocation, the cost allocation system that Sandy had every every department, including the council, had to share its cost of the overhead. I don't think we we haven't had too many sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but there's a large there's a amount budgeted, and we haven't gotten we've left a lot, and I think that's because we've had fewer sandwiches. So it's advertising, um, communications, those kind of things. Some of our dues and subscriptions to various organizations. We had had a line for other purchase services, which was quite high. That's the one we really knocked down. Uh, printing and binding, um, travel transportation has been about the same. Meetings and then miscellaneous, we dropped from 1,400 to 700 because we'd only spent a couple hundred the year before. That's probably the meal stuff, which is mm -hmm. we really don't spend a lot on that. It's rare when we do it. But sometimes because of time, you know. Okay. Right. For the same reasons that you mentioned, someone if you're going to have to meet at 5:30. Mm -hmm. They're like, I can't do it because we need. Well, and in the last fiscal year, that council retreat, and it drove up mm -hmm. a lot of the costs. And that was a lot of that was just uh, dealing with contract, right? Uh, for facilitating that yeah. entire uh, process. So yeah, there was some meal, some meal and room rental fees associated with getting the group together. But it was, it was pretty normal. I'd like to see us do more professional development like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I don't feel like we need to make a decision on this tonight, but I just wanted so. to yeah. have Thank that be you. part of the. No, it's time to raise it. Is there? Uh, I mean, it, this is something that I'm interested in talking about. I mean, if this is. I, I'm. I guess I'm wondering if, the, if there are other people that are interested in hammering out a number that would make sense, um, and we can come with a proposal. So I feel like someone's got it. 
Someone's got to figure out what's the right number. And we even had a citizen or two bring it up. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it would be good. I'm interested in it. Okay. Should we have a chat about that and come proposal and we can go from there? Or? Yeah. Else? Okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can run that out too, you know, just using the numbers you gave us compared to what, you know, what budget impact would be compared to, it's 1500 now, right? So, no, it's no, a thousand a month. Thousand. Or a thousand a, 12, a year. 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 100 a month. 100 a month. Yeah. 100 a month. So, <laughs> so, yeah, you're, you know, you're talking $4,800. If, if you choose 2000 as a basis, for example, I just was 100 hours at $20 an hour. That's 2000 so from 1200 to 800 for six people. That's forty eight hundred dollars, and the mayor's at three thousand, I think. No, isn't yeah, three thousand? So if you bump that up to thirty five hundred or something like that, you know, you're talking fifty three hundred dollars total. When was the last time it was increased? Not that long ago. Um, within say three or four years, that I don't hold. It was that. before it more than that. that it was before, before so John, but, but it wasn't years, but long it before John. It was maybe just a year or two right. before John. Jim Sheridan pushed it as he was leaving office because same reason, right. he was, hmm. and it went up. I think it had been, I want to say it was a thousand and twenty-seven hundred, and it went to twelve hundred and three thousand or something like that. You could also use the yeah. annual um, increase in wage inflation for Vermont <laughs> over that period of time as another metric for. Establishing a fair, a fair and um, mm -hmm. justifiable increase in salary. There's any you know, staff help that we can provide, and, and, and let me know if I can help. Kind of coming up with that. Kind of I tell you, the mayor say anybody want, who's running for mayor, I'm just saying, who's doing that for the money. <laughs> <laughs> Priorities are miscarried. Right. <laughs> uh, I've. Cool. But it does raise a valid point that there's a barrier to entry for some people uh, that's financial. Um, yep. And this is a, a strenuous Very process for everyone involved. Um, there's, there's no doubt that there's a big commitment, and it's, it's more than financial. But A couple hundred dollars is a step in the right direction, but probably won't make much difference. Certainly no one's going to make a decision to run based on salary alone. <laughs> that's not a part of my decision-making process. <laughs> But that is a luxury that we have. Yes, and we true. Recognize that. True. Yes. Yes. Okay. Other issues for tonight? Uh, uh, done. Well, I know usually you save these sort of comments for the council reports, but since we have the department heads, I just really want to thank you all for the good work you do. And this last week, DPW was out with a broken main line in the cold, cold. Thank you very much. <laughs> the fire department was out. Kudos, the police had an armed robbery. I mean, you know, it's all sorts of things happening, and you've all been there. So thank you all very much. Structure fire as well. Yep, that's far. <laughs> Busy 30 days. So. Okay, great. With, uh, so that's it for tonight. We'll move on. There's not much to move on. Okay. So oh. as we're wrapping up the budget, then, what what are We've got CVPSA, which will be kind of a separate issue, and, and Harbor, uh, the Fremont Transit. So, is there a, the only pending budget adjustment issue is possible council pay? Is that what I'm hearing? Yep. No, I mean, that's fine. Yep. I just wanted. Sure. Well, actually, I do have. I'm sorry, I, I forgot I do have one other question, which is um, something that we have talked about in the past uh, was for the next fix, uh, fiscal year doing. Uh, re-examining our ordinances and that that mm -hmm. was going to require some additional legal fees. Um, and I just want to confirm that there's nothing in for that. Uh, that's that's something that I would want to consider, um, you know, uh, because it is, it is um, sort of an inherent foible of the process that we are setting the budget now for next year's goals and if we think that that's something that we want to do I would want to uh, I mean that's something that we sort of pulled back from this year um, so you know if if that's what it takes just if we could get an estimate for what you think it might cost to add that in that would I think that would be really talk helpful. About I don't have any idea right now so we have to think about um, is that that or how many you know if we could do some or what. Sure yeah. Um, Tony, when we mentioned looking at ordinances before, you talked about getting an intern that would really be massive undertaking. 
Do I remember that correct? Yeah, but I have no idea. I mean, before legal, just to, <coughs> to do some of the processing and pulling things out. I just think about the pain that we shot. I mean, one of the goals of solving restorative justice is more appropriate to get us more towards that sort of community. Um, and I'm just thinking about the dog ordinance, that how much that one ordinance took. And a good and, and a good example of that was we all and staff take as much hit, hit on this as everybody, but you know, we set a goal of being more restorative and, and incorporating restorative justice whenever we could in ordinances, and then we passed, you know, the the building demolition ordinance, and we didn't put any restorative options in there at all. So we just so you know again, I think we got to mm -hmm. we got to look through and. Well, we can use the league too. We don't. Yeah. We, we have a membership there for a reason. To a point. They're, yeah. They, yeah. They don't. They'll give you quick advice if they do, if they do a more significant review. You still pay them. Yeah. Okay. For additional service. But it just seems that, like the initial level yeah. might not need the lawyer versus the last. One. <laughs> okay. So I think it's a lot of it's a lot of time of somebody. Oh, but yes. you could potentially yeah. come back to us yeah. with we'll uh, talk about some estimates. Think. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, so then. Okay, council reports. Rosie. Uh, I will pass. Uh, just an early warning that uh, on January 31st, there will be uh, like a tree festival um, that the tree board is putting together. So um, looking forward to getting more details from them about that, but just wanted you all know. January 31st. Pass. Yeah. I've already said thank you to everybody. Thank you. Pass. Pass. All right, well, that's quick. Uh, I just had one thing. Bill and I had talked about the annual report. We voted on our consent agenda a couple weeks ago to continue doing it on, on an electronic basis. Bid. To we approve the bid, and he and I had talked beforehand about whether we ought to put something out to the community to ask how they'd rather how they would like to receive it. My sense is that people don't read it, uh, but we do have, ironically, these boxes that we do order that that set because they don't go to everybody, and so people just don't think to go get one. So I. I suggested maybe we put something out on front porch forum or some other way just to ask people what they think do we want to go back to getting hard copies or do we like the idea of just doing it electronically <clears throat> i know it's a lot of resources but i also don't think they get i don't think they get read so that's the trade-off in my view um, what, I mean, just, well, what was interesting with the bid it cost us as much <clears throat> to have printed copies with the digital and to have just dis digital maybe we don't need as many but i think we should always have a, a few well, I think the issue, the real issue is, you know, we'll probably, if we continue the way we're going, we'll probably just can keep calibrating until we get the right amount, what's the right that yep. amounts. It's going to be not very many. Right. Um, and it's, and over time, it's going to be less and less, I think, what we, yep. we, it's typically the older population that asks for the books versus delivering them to the homes. And I right. Think there was some sentiment that when they just showed up, people looked at them and read them even if it's just for a few minutes, it was like, oh, it's kind of city government. But the, the counter concern was a lot of wasted paper. They get thrown away or, you know, recycled or whatever. And, you know, are they worth the value? So a few years ago, the council, we saved a little bit of money, but a lot of it was also for environmental reasons to just cut back and go the electronic version. But, you know, it's harder to tell, I mean, whether people are actually going online and looking at it or whether they're, you know, we, we do have leftover books in the places we put them out and we've got tons of them here still so mm. uh, so I think that's the question I hope yeah no it is I guess if there's maybe just a preliminary question is maybe we just ask Jamie to put something out on front porch form and get feedback and see what From people want to do and Facebook and Facebook yeah exactly that's maybe. the different but that again you, you miss <coughs> the people who are most likely to want it. that's all that's well true. and the bridge article yeah. then yeah be the other place to put it yeah well, we have some of the most engaged and informed citizens here in Montpelier, but I think Thomas Jefferson really said it best when he said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects what never was and never will be. Um, and so the more that we can put the information out there to help people be even better informed, uh, so much the better. Just okay, maybe well, should mention, I would just mention that we, you know, our office is probably the number one place people come for that, and we haven't we haven't really had any issues with people complaining about it not being delivered. 
Should we ask or should we just? I think it's worth an ask. Yeah. I like getting people involved yeah. in the ask, process. Ask, ask. There's there we no, go. There's no, no harm in asking. Ask. You can ask Jamie to put it on Front Porch Forum and Facebook and it will be done. You right. know, I, another way to frame the question is uh, where would you expect the annual report to be available? Uh, because it might actually be really convenient to have it at, I think some people expect it to be at the library. Probably, like if there are, are places throughout the city where we can be dropping them off, um, you know, thinking at cafes or the co-op or, you know, places where people are just sitting, um, that those might, that, I mean, that's going to be tops, 20 copies. Um, but just knowing if, if people would appreciate to ha having them at those locations. That's a great idea. And the pass-through rate too, right, is huge if you put it Ten copies in Capitol Grounds, you're going to get way more participation than mailing 20 copies to 20 individuals. Could, could, could we don't you know. ask That's it open-ended like that? Like, where would you, where in the community would you expect to find it? Yeah, them? you or could. I mean, if you're just doing a Google form, um, you could leave it open-ended and let people submit their own answers, or you could have check off some? check boxes. Like, if you had some places that we and then other suggestions. Other and what, or list, let's say you list 10, your top three places to pick sure. it up. So <coughs> you have to focus on where they were really. Yeah, either way. Focus. You was online. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> so just do want to add that uh, historically it has been delivered at the library, the senior center. It's been available here in the clerk's office. Post office. Post office and also uh, during the actual annual meeting mm -hmm. here as well. So there have been historical drop locations and we can certainly keep that. Yeah. Yeah, we hadn't gone into businesses, <coughs> stayed out of yeah. you know, public places, but if businesses wanted them and mm -hmm. you know, were willing to take them as a... Cool. All right, so with that, with that. Oh, Janet, sir, oh, I, I just want to say a couple things. Um, I uh, all probably read in the paper, my new big cause is election security. I went out and got certified as a penetration tester. It's a very cool <laughs> title. It's Senate, uh, Certified Ethical Hacker. So anyways, I'm all about that. Um, uh, but the other thing I just wanted to mention, uh, which is that you all and everybody who's listening is invited to a party that I'm going to have here uh, upstairs, my 50th birthday party. I'm in serious, I have serious mortality issues, so I figured the only way to deal with it is just to have a blowout open to the public. <laughs> it's going to be February 17th. Upstairs, going to have a cash bar. I've got distribution rights to show Stop Making Sense, and when that's not playing, there'll be music. It's going to be great. Everybody mark your calendars. You won't be able to miss it by the time I'm done with it, but you all are the first to know. I don't know if Pop I can. That. I was gonna say I don't know if I can stop. <laughs> Although stop making sense kind of goes with the job, doesn't it? Um, uh, just that next meeting, all we have on the agenda right now is the TIF discussion and wastewater uh, recovery. And we're not sure how long that part will be after. Oh. We're we're so. When do you know? Are can we get the wastewater? Stuff, yes, water you recovery will. stuff in well in advance because yes. it seems yes. like a pretty complex. Yes. Well, it is pretty complex, so and we're we're yes, thank you. so we're trying to figure out where we're at with that, and you know we're having many of the same questions. Some of you. Well, are I think TIF as well. I think we yeah, well, some TIF, assurance we weren't going to get that at the last minute. Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, we're so working we're on TIF right. now, but those, so the good the point is that's all we've got. So if you want to talk, and if the wastewater stuff is shorter than anticipated, if <laughs> it might be. Oh, okay. It might okay. All right. Go. And dog ordinance? We're considering all options, including requesting delaying that, because we're not as satisfied with all the information either. So, but we haven't decided that yet. So, if that's the case, I just would give you an update on where we're at and what we're thinking and, mm -hmm. you know, so okay. sneak preview. So, that could, could considerably open. So, any of this budget stuff we could finish up next week. So we'll try to get some of the answers. And you could have a short meeting. Which is nice. We have four meetings this month. So <laughs> I don't think we have to feel guilty about. We don't have one on the 17th. Oh, we don't. Just we're still holding that. Third. Well, if we need it. So we can, can we let the 17th go? Tell me. We decide, decide next at week? our next meeting. Okay, we'll decide next week. 
Yeah, but but the seventeenth is not a regular. It's only a, a if needed meeting. All right. Without objection, we will be adjourned at nine ten. Thank you, everybody.